This is the first stethoscope. It came out around 1820, which made it the most advanced diagnostic technology in medicine at the time, and it's just a long tube of boxwood with a skinny hole down the middle. Even by 19th century standards, this thing was extremely simple. So I was curious, why did it take so long to come up with this first stethoscope design? And after it came out, how was it received, and how did it actually change the process of diagnosis? Some things haven't changed. Like, doctors have always taken a history where they would ask the patient questions about their health, and they've understood the importance of gathering both signs and symptoms. Symptoms are the things that patients say about themselves, like saying that something hurts, while signs are things the physician observes on the patient's body, which are more measurable. And there are all kinds of methods for finding signs. Like, you could feel a pulse, or look at a tongue, or in the case of diabetes, taste the urine. But doctors didn't listen directly to the body that often. That's because by the standards of the day, they didn't really need to. For most of history, doctors believed in some variation of humoral theory, the idea that health came from a balance of the four bodily humors, or fluids. And in this system, health was influenced by literally everything. What you ate, how you slept, your menstruation, whether you spent any time in the south of Italy, everything affected your humors. So from an old-timey physician's perspective, taking a history, asking good questions, was the best way to diagnose humoral health. It was way harder to hear a humoral imbalance, but some doctors did try. Like Hippocrates and his students in ancient Greece would put their ears to their patient's chest and listen for anything weird. This is called immediate auscultation. According to Hippocrates, you shall know by this that the chest contains water and not pus, if in applying the ear during a certain time on the side, you perceive a noise like that of boiling vinegar. No, yeah, sure, we all know what that sounds like. Hippocrates would also take people by the armpits and shake them around to see if there was any fluid splashing around in their chest, a technique called succussion, which is just an incredible visual. All right, so fast forward to the 1700s when this story picks up, and the physical exam was about as sophisticated as it was back in antiquity. Except, now that doctors actually got university educations, a stigma had developed about actually touching the patient. Physicians were great intellectuals, so their great clinical talent was intuiting the problem with the patient. Only a lowly surgeon uses tools, or God forbid, actually touches a patient. You were considered a better doctor if you could take the patient's history, name the disease, and leave. I mean, nobody's treatments actually worked back then, so it didn't really matter, but that does answer one of our questions from the intro. Nobody thought of stethoscopes because doctors valued their intuition over diagnostic tools. But then came along this guy, an Austrian doctor named Leopold Auenbrugger. According to a poorly documented but often repeated oral history, Auenbrugger's dad was an innkeeper, so he always had a couple of wine barrels around. He noticed that his dad would tap on the side of a wine barrel to check how full it was before serving the guests, and it would make a hollow, higher pitch noise if the barrel was empty, and a dull, flat noise if it were full. This is a technique called percussion. It's the same idea when you tap on the wall to find the studs. So one day, the younger Alan Brugger decided to apply the same logic to his patient's chest, and he noticed the same phenomenon. A normal, healthy chest would sound sharp and hollow, but some chests sounded dull, which pointed to disease. Now, a few physicians had used percussion in this way before, but Alan Brugger decided that he would do it more systematically. He would percuss the patient, write down his notes, and then when the patient died, he would perform an autopsy and see what was wrong with him. I talked about this a bunch in the humoral theory video, but an Italian scientist named Giovanni Battista Morgani was making this kind of autopsy autopsy study popular at the time. So Alan Brugger got to work percussing all the human thoraxes he could, making his best guess about their disease, then confirming or correcting his guess after they died. And after a while, he got pretty good at it. Like, a patient might look totally healthy, but using percussion, he could find dropsy, which is what they called edema, or generalized swelling back then. He was also able to find fluid accumulation in the lung cavity, or what's called pleural effusion, which was unfortunately common thanks to tuberculosis back then. He wrote all of his observations and a description of his percussion technique into a book titled Inventum Novum, or New Invention, which he published in 1761. And then just kind of nothing happened. That was until 1808, when Napoleon Bonaparte's personal physician, Jean-Nicolas Corvisar, translated Inventum Novum from Latin into French. And while he gave Alan Brugger plenty of credit, his book was more of an adaptation than a strict translation. Corvisar added over 345 pages to the original text, which is impressive considering Auenbrugger only had 95 pages to begin with. Now, to be fair, Auenbrugger's book was the accumulation of seven years of work, while Corvisar wrote his after 20 years of percussion practice. And he was a big fan of percussion as a clinical tool. 
In the preface to his edition of Inventum Novum, he puts his full trust in the power of observation, saying, Of all the physical sciences in general, there is perhaps not one in which it matters more to consult the senses than in practical medicine. Practical meaning clinical more than academic. But Corvisar's love of percussion and observation were part of something bigger, a symptom in the diagnosis of a changing clinical medicine landscape, if you will. See, Corvisar was also a medical educator in Paris at a time when this one city was changing medicine into something more modern and clinical. It became known as the Paris Clinical School. Not a physical building, more like a school of thought. After all the fighting in the French Revolution, the New Republic urgently needed doctors and had this opportunity to think about the best ways to train them. And when it came to a teaching style, the French were all about the scientific model. I hinted at this with Alan Bruecker's story, but by the 18th century, there was a cultural shift in science away from philosophy and towards empirical data collection. And medicine was totally a part of that. Hospitals as institutions were shifting away from hospice care centers and orphanages and becoming proper scientific institutions. And Paris had some of the oldest and most famous hospitals in Europe, including the Charité, the Pitié, and the Hotel Dieu, right on the River Seine. So the new Paris medical education system would combine cutting edge science, which yes, is my favorite dissection pun, along with clinical practice in the city's hospitals. Students at the Paris Faculty of Medicine learned about the body by actually interacting with patients and performing autopsies after the patient died. And outside of the classroom, Corvisar was one of those scientists who tried to match clinical presentations with finding on autopsy, and he was frustrated by how often trusting the old school abstract theories led to error. He was convinced that using observation and tools like percussion would reduce error and he'd get diagnoses right more often. And if he could share his findings with other doctors, the entire clinical school could improve too. But there was a big challenge describing what the chest sounds like. Remember, the best that Hippocrates could come up with was that boiling vinegar sound, and Corvisar ran into the same problem. He so desperately wanted to communicate the kinds of things he heard from percussion, but describing it in words was impossible for him. Beyond calling something dull or sharp, there's a lot of nuance to hear through percussion. Luckily, Corvisar had one student in particular that used the acoustic side of percussion in a cool new way. René Theophilus Hyacinth Lenec. Princess of Gen Wait, no. Lenec was born in 1781 and spent his teenage years with his uncle in Nantes. Uncle Lenec was the dean of the university's medical faculty, so by the time he was 14, young Rene was already helping out at the Hotel Du, the major hospital in town. He got through medical school and became a surgeon at 18. A terrifying thought for me as someone who teaches 18 year olds. In 1800, Lenec moved to Paris to study at L'Ecole Pratique, where he had a legendary roster of mentors, like Marie Bichat, who invented the field of histology, or Guillaume de Pouchon, who medical students might know from de Pouchon's contracture, and of course, Jean Nicolas Corvisar from a minute ago. Corvisar was already an autopsy pro and taught his students the practice of linking pathologic anatomy during autopsy with the patient's signs and symptoms while they were alive. And Lenec used those same techniques to write a bunch of interesting papers while he was still a student. His first paper was all about peritonitis, an inflammation of the peritoneum, which is the lining of your abdomen. A few years later, autopsy studies led him to notice something about tuberculosis that nobody else had documented at that point. That those classic tubercles that his colleagues found in the lungs could form in different parts of the body. He published his thesis in 1804 and then became a full-fledged physician. He spent the next few years working in his private practice, working with medical societies, and writing journal articles about pathologic anatomy. But in 1816, he became the head physician at the Necker Hospital in Paris, which is where he made his most important contribution. One day in September of 1816, Lenec was walking around the Louvre and noticed some kids playing with a long piece of wood. One of the little boys would tap little codes on one side, and the other boy would put his ear up to the other side and listen to the noise, which was amplified through the wood. A quiet noise on one end, loud and clear on the other. Kind of like how when you want to eavesdrop on your roommates, you put your ear to the wall. We could support Patrick on Patreon. A few months later, an overweight young woman came into Lenec's office who had some general symptoms of heart disease. And his first choice would have been to use percussion, but that proved difficult, as he so delicately put it, on account of the great degree of fatness. And he couldn't put his ear to her chest because she was a young woman and that would have just been oh so scandalous. And that's when he remembered the boys playing with that piece of wood. So he grabbed a nearby stack of paper, rolled it up tight into a tube, put one end to the woman's chest and the other end to his ear. And not only could he hear the patient's heartbeat, it was more clear than if he put his ear to her chest. As Lenec himself said, I was not a little surprised and pleased to find that I could thereby perceive the action of the heart in a manner much more clear and distinct than I had ever been able to do by the immediate application of the ear. 
From this moment, I imagine that the circumstance might furnish means for enabling us to ascertain the character, not only of the action of the heart, but of every species of sound produced by the motion of all the thoracic viscera. But if he was going to use this new tool in the clinic, he'd need something more permanent than some loose leaf papers. So Lenek started toying around with different designs for a better auscultation tool. Remember, he was first inspired by that game the kids were playing with wood. So he tried to roll the papers into a solid paper log, but he could never quite get rid of that gap in the middle. And that turned out to be a good thing. He found that having some kind of central hole long ways through the device worked better than a piece of solid wood. After trying all kinds of different lengths and widths of tubes and different types of wood, he settled on this, the first stethoscope. Three and a half centimeters in diameter, 25 centimeters long, designed to be detachable for transportation with a little plug to listen to the heart better. He called this new device the stethoscope. Stethos meaning chest, scopos meaning examination. For the next three years, he documented the kinds of sounds he heard when listening to patients' lungs, and he had plenty of opportunity. He examined literally thousands of tuberculosis patients in his lifetime. He divided the normal breathing sounds into pulmonary and bronchial sounds, before describing adventitious, or abnormal sounds. And some of them make sense, like rattle, hissing, or crackling. Even metallic tinkling is oddly descriptive. But some of them were brand new for the time, like rails, bruise, egophony, bronchophony. French speakers probably caught bruy in there, which just means noise. Real creative. And he didn't just listen to the lungs. He used the stethoscope to listen to the heart, and correctly matched heart sounds to the contraction of different chambers of the heart. He even used the term murmur to describe certain heart abnormalities for the first time. And this was a big deal because he had finally solved the problem that Corvisar was frustrated with years earlier. Lynette gave doctors a common language for talking about these sounds. And by putting a name to the sounds, he helped doctors standardize their physical exam. Now by itself, that would already be a cool application of the stethoscope. But remember, all of this was ultimately trying to get a better idea of what was happening under the patient's skin. And that meant following up with autopsies. Sure enough, Lenek noticed that some tuberculosis patients' lungs were filled with fluid or pus, which explains some of those moist lung sounds. Did not think I was going to say moist lung sounds today. And that helped him build a more accurate clinical description of tuberculosis, including what a doctor should listen for when diagnosing it. It didn't help treat TB yet, but it was still progress in diagnosis. Either way, it was clear that the stethoscope was a useful tool. So by February of 1818, he started lecturing other doctors about how they might use it too. And in 1819, Lynette came out with a big summary of his findings, which got an English translation in 1821, a treatise on the diseases of the chest and on immediate auscultation. Remember, immediate was putting your ear right on somebody's chest, immediate involves this medium, the stethoscope. The book was received mostly positively by reviewers, but at the practical level, his book was huge for the medical community. After it came out, Lenek had medical students and practicing doctors from all around Europe come to his lectures to learn auscultation. And a few years after Lenek's invention, doctors started experimenting with their own stethoscope designs. The skinny, flared, monaural style, meaning one ear, got really popular. You can find them all over eBay today. After those, we got binaural stethoscopes, which went in both ears. There are descriptions of these things as far back as 1829, but the guy who usually gets credit is an Irish physician named Arthur Leard, who made a flexible rubber tube version that looks more familiar to today's stethoscopes. Sadly, Lenek died of tuberculosis in 1826 at only 45 years old. And while I'm sure he'd be proud of the popularity of the stethoscope, I bet he's even more proud of why it became popular. Lenek and the rest of the Paris Clinical School represented a turning point in medicine. Quite literally, doctors would finally start listening to their patients' bodies and start forming a diagnosis based on pathological anatomy, as opposed to an imbalance of humors. By the way, if you want to learn more about that humoral theory, I made a video all about it that I think you're going to like. You can find it right here. And if you want to help me make more videos like these, the best way to do that is to support me on Patreon. $2 a month gets you access to my archive of unlisted videos and early access to future videos. Thank you, patrons, and thank you for watching.